Namaste. Hello, my friends. So glad to be with you in this brand new year. We made it. We made it. Doesn't a trauma survivor or don't I, a trauma survivor, always wonder if I'm going to make it? Am I going to survive? And, you know, I know the ACEs study tells me really clearly that the higher my points, the more likely I am to die early, to. Well, that's it, isn't it? To get some kind of a disease, predictable disease, autoimmune disease, heart disease, cancer, something awful that will steal my life away. That is the threat to each trauma survivor. If you're a trauma survivor and you know your ACEs score, adverse childhood experiences score, the higher it is. So over four points, there are some difficult predictions, very difficult predictions. Um, about our lifespan, our life, the quality of our life. So I'm here to celebrate. <laughs> I'm now 78 as of six o'clock yesterday morning, December 31st, 2023. I have been on this earth for 78 years and that is beyond what I'm supposed to be. And so there we have it as a trauma survivor, all of those expectations that are there for us, that are supposed to tell us who we are, what we're about, how we are to live our lives, and what traits we will have. <laughs> Let me do this, Sicilian. The, the hell with that. We get to choose. I'm not saying it's easy. There have been many times in my life when I have felt choice. I don't have a choice. I was given this past. It has locked. It has locked my nerve cells into reaction. I am not free to act. And yet over and over and over the years of turning around to say, hello, trauma. Yeah, you happened. Yeah, incest, you happened. No one else on this earth or in this family will say that incest happened. We experienced it. Beatings. I experience them. Blackout, I experience that from beatings. Shame every day. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Who do you think you are? What's wrong with you? Can't you get anything right? These are the things that I heard, and these are the messages that I should, should, should have carried forth into my adult life, and I did. And so here I am. Here we are on this. I'm trying to bring more light. There we go. On this, New Year's day 2024 i'm here to celebrate that it was four years ago the very day that covid got announced this book came out maybe there's synchronicity there right happiness is running through the streets to find you we can translate trauma's harsh legacy into healing and i'm just wanting to say i'm it's an honor it's a pleasure it's a heartwarming delight to be with you, my friends who either are trauma survivors or you know well what it's like to be with trauma survivors. How could most of us not be trauma survivors? Let's consider that. What is trauma? It's either one event which is so life-threatening that it freezes our brain into a pattern of fight, flight, fawn, float, or there's another one, the five Fs. All of these different responses, reactions we have to avoiding the fact that we were under threat, that our lives were threatened. So it can be one event. We could simply have been a child observing 911. The horrible visual, horrible guttural, horrible visceral moments of 911, we simply could have observed that and it could have stayed with us the rest of our lives. I'm 78. So what stayed with me the rest of my life was when I was in, I guess, my 20s, maybe 30s, probably 20s, maybe teens. I was looking at something which was called Life Magazine, I think. And on the front of it was a young girl, a young girl without even hair on her body. And she was running. She was an Asian girl. She turned out she was Vietnamese. She was running from implosion, ex explosions, napalm being dropped behind her. And she was the essence of grief, anger, rage, sorrow, 
terror. Perhaps you've seen her picture. I saw her picture and it went into my being. It went into my soul. So much so that when I was finally able to be free enough from the restraints that fear put upon me, I was finally free enough to say, I can do this. I can travel 15 hours to, to, to Vietnam. I can go there. And what was my heartfelt impetus? My heartfelt urge, desire, desire to go to Vietnam. It was to see if the children were okay. You know, in Africa, I don't recall what culture, I apologize for that, but there's a saying, are the children okay? Because, and you know this, right? If the children are okay, then the culture's going to be okay. Then the future's going to be okay. If we tend to the children, it's no accident that many people watching this are tending to the children, are hoping to bring to children the promise of a true life, not half a life. You know, there was a, a saying from a movie that I grew up with in my 20s or something, and it was, half a loaf is better than none. It's got to be true, right? However, life is a full loaf. It's a full loaf combining everything, the sadness, the sorrow, the joy, the uplifting moments. Yeah. And what I would like to say to you today on this New Year's Day is our topic is just as last week our topic was finding our way on Christmas Day, today is finding our way on New Year's Day, every New Year's Day. How can we, as trauma survivors, or people who love and are close with trauma survivors, be that trauma, traumatized person one day old or 101 years old, or like me, 78 years old? How can we find our way? And that means originality. That means my, my brain is flashing back to my most recent article, which is called Glimmers of Genius. It was published in November, I believe, in uh, Exchange by Exchange Press, uh, Exchange Magazine. You can find it, Glimmers of Genius. It's, it's acknowledging that genius is a verb, not a noun. It's acknowledging that genius isn't just a static number of IQ points based on a flawed test, a flawed test made by white men for white men. It doesn't begin to, I'm telling you the truth here, it doesn't begin to measure or even comprehend or even contemplate the wisdom of people from diverse cultures, the wisdom of people who are otherwise able, the wisdom of people who are not of the male testosterone gender, and I'm the male testosterone gender, what I do oppose is the privilege and entitlement that has been granted to one class, one race, as if there were race, but one perceived race, and one gender. Forever. Forever. Isn't there a Jewish prayer that says, Sorry, I'm getting it wrong, but I think I'm getting it right. I've talked with my friends who, who have talked about their warring against this. Thank you, God, for not making me a woman. I knew a man, an ethnic man, an ethnic man, whose grandparents were from the old country. It doesn't matter which old country, but whose grandparents were from the old country. And he used to wake up in the morning and say, very bright guy. IQ, genius. And yet, listen to what he said. And I'm not damning him. I'm repeating what he said because it was a fact of his life. Thank you, God, for making me male and making me male. Look, this is the first day of a new year. How can we accept our own genius? How can I accept my genius? Battered and smacked around and incested and humiliated and shamed as I was. How can I accept my own genius? Well, I'm, I am. I am beginning to. And my resolution, and now I invite you on this first day of the year. Are you a resolution person? A person who says, yeah, this is my resolution for this coming year. There's something sacred in that. 
we claim our heartfelt desire. We claim our hope. Or maybe what we're claiming is our intellectual goal. And that's okay. Whatever it is, it says something to us. We can look at that and say, what does this say to us? I mean, years ago, and you know, I think I read this in my book, because my birthday is New Year's Eve, I take and took resolutions to heart. And I thought, I want to have a better life in this coming year. How can I? I'd be happier? How can I be more true? How can I live a life that's more aligned with who I am, with life forces, less fearful? You see, for me as a trauma survivor, trauma adds up to fear. Let me just complete that thought. Trauma comes either from one stark, harsh, abject event, like being in a house fire or seeing someone killed or being threatened, your life being threatened yourself. Or trauma comes from, and that causes post-traumatic stress disorder or trauma can be of the complex sort, which is what I have, I have both actually. Complex post-traumatic stress disorder comes from a number of repeated traumatic life-threatening uh, or, or, and that can be spiritually life threatening, not just physically life life threatening. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Who do you think you are? What's wrong? All of those statements that tell a child you're not who you are is not who we want. We don't want you. We don't want you get out of our lives. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall, and all the king's forces and all the king's men could not put Humpty together again. So with that background and reminder of what trauma is, trauma is a continuously inflicted way of teaching our brain that we don't matter, that we would be better off dead. I'd be better off without you. Yeah, get her out of my sight, is what my father said to my mother when he saw me as an infant, when he saw me as a toddler. Get her out of my sight. Bring her into my soul. What's right with you? Thank you for doing whatever you're doing. To learn. To learn. It's not about getting it right. It's not about getting it wrong. It's not about that. It's about living your life. And let's go now to resolutions. Resolution is what? It's a resolve that this coming year, I will hold myself to a certain standard and I will go back home to that standard all the time. Now, what I thought and what many of us believe about a resolution is it's a way to make our bad selves better. At least <laughs> that's the message I got. Um, it's like Lent. What do we do? We give up our sins for Lent. We give up chocolate. We give up us. We give up things that, that, that are sins. And what's a sin? A sin is one definition. A sin is whatever separates us from the divine. Well, look, let me just get down to it. My resolutions have been all about either or, right, wrong, day, night, chosen, unchosen, worthwhile, worthless, and yes, white, and black, that's the way I was raised. I was raised to not know that I'm black. I am black, Nigerian, Ghanaian, Sierra Leone. That's in my heritage, as much as my mother's Scottish, perhaps, Germanic, likely, uh, and my father's Sicilian heritage. So, so, so I was raised to believe that whites are superior to blacks. They say they have what? Spray gray. It's great, great. My friend Carol is my friend Carol. My friend Mary Catherine, her Hannah, is my BFF. I love her. What the hell are you talking about? What the hell are you talking about? And when my parents took us away from school, for what they wanted, I mean, they understood it. They wanted to be in warm weather. My mother was so depressed. She needed to have sun. She thrived in sun. Sometimes, sometimes it couldn't heal her. 
but they would take us to Indian Rocks Beach on the west coast of Florida. Was that privilege? I guess. We all stayed in one motel room. That was not pretty. That's pretty ugly, actually. With all that tension and all that. Oh. But we stayed in one motel room, and what I would do to survive is get up in the morning and go out on the beach, and nobody really gave a sweet dippy where I was as long as they could count me at the end of the day. <laughs> so they wouldn't get in trouble. But that's it. They really were so troubled by family that they left my older sister, Lynn, at a state park. They didn't think about her. They were lost in their own post-traumatic stress disorder. And they loaded the car with all the objects and things that were required to go to the state park with children. I was the youngest, so I got loaded in. The oldest got loaded in. And my sister Lynn got left behind. She never forgot that. Of course, she never forgot that. To be on scene like that will wreck anybody's sense of well-being. So resolutions, let's look at that. How do we find, how do I, how do you find your way on New Year's Day? A resolution in my, before my books, was my desire to be better than I was at best, and I'm tentative about using that term at best, it was also a way of reclaiming myself. It was a way of saying I'm worthy, I'm worthwhile, but notice to be worthy and worthwhile, I had to do penance. I had to say, I am, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. Forgive me, world, that I'm not perfect. That was the message. And so I want to say for me, and perhaps not for you, but for me, a, a New Year's resolution was for years about getting rid, expunging, excavating, excising, going under the knife and carving and cutting out the bloody mess that was in me so that I could be a more perfect union, so I could be more acceptable. Today, January 1st, 2024, I believe in my heart and in my soul that it's not perfection. Perfection, as a dear friend and trauma surviving therapist said to me, perfection is an immediate response to being shamed. Perfectionism is an immediate response to being shamed. Think about that if you want to. I became a perfectionist when I saw, get her out of my sight, that no one wanted me, that who I was, the darkest, freest, most spontaneous, most joy-filled person in a family of joyless, controlled, restricted, hate-filled, shame-filled, self-loathing-filled people. And I was totally not a member. I didn't belong. As I learned in a, in a meditation in my 40s, when I meditated about what were some of the things I had forgotten because they were too painful. And I uh, thought that what might be brought back to me was some of the memories of sexual abuse, which took me forever to be able to feel, to acknowledge, because I couldn't bear to feel them. I couldn't bear to feel them. Or another thing I couldn't acknowledge, viscerally, was my mad mother, when my mother went into her insane places. And she had other parts of her that were lovely. She was a sought after, beautiful, blonde, blue-eyed woman, my opposite. She had the perfect nose. I've got a nose that's off kilter. Oh, what abuse is that from? She had burning blue eyes, tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. I called them Bunsen burner blue eyes from my days as a teenager taking physics and chemistry and seeing the blue flame. It's a for us. 
she was a beautiful woman, and yet she was vested with the family. Her mother was hospitalized for insanity, given shock treatment. My grandmother, Adolorata, on the other side, was given shock treatment for insanity. I am the inheritor of these generations of insanity. And so when my mother is out an infant, a child, a teenager, elementary school, uh, when she would go into her most desperate, abjectly hellish place, where I believe she was in touch with the incest she received, the violence she received, the beatings she received, the shaming she received. When she got in touch with that, when her body got in touch with that, he made a noise that would freeze. People as if an atomic bomb had been brought to be devastated. And that's what it did, and it got in my soul. And one day I had the courage, because I had a loving, caring, highly efficient, brilliant trauma coach, Dr. Bernard Gray, wherever you are, God bless you, who said to me, it's okay, make the sound. He didn't even say it's okay. He said, can you make the sound? I didn't know if I dared make it. it. And I literally watched the, the brick walls in his old mill building in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, a quaver. And I watched him. It, it looked to me as if he was being exploded, imploded, blasted out of his chair and was smashed through the wall. That's how powerful the agony of trauma, being a trauma survivor is, who would ever want to face that? Well, I chose to face it because I wanted to have my life back. And on this New Year's Day, how do I find my way? I challenge the ways of knowing that I was given. I challenge the either or, good, bad, black, white. I challenge chosen or unchosen, sinner or sacred. I challenge that. I've just come back from those weeks in Kerala, in India, where I took in the ancient carvings of gods and goddesses, of everyday people who were both people who were sexual and divine. What is wrong with that? Nothing. Thing. Sexuality can be sacred, right? It's not, well, I mean, in my history of religion, it was a sin. Women, you're going to have pain for the rest of your life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. now I'm, I'm, I'm even questioning myself there. Was it for being sexual? Was it for eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge, which was forbidden? Well, come on. Why? Be forbidden knowledge that sets up such a hierarchy. I don't understand. Unless message is look, on earth you will, I will know so many things. I will learn so many things. I will need to learn so much. Mm -hmm. And I still am. And in the Hindu way, maybe I will have a number of lives. Maybe this life is based on what I learned last time around, and maybe next time around I have more to learn. I'm okay with that. I don't know. I'm okay with that. But on this day of days, this day of setting resolutions, which to me meant excising, getting rid of who I was, the evil about who I was, and changing myself so I'm a better person, I believed that for years. And I believed it because I felt better when I was a better person. And today at age 78, I'm, I'm confronting that. Confront doesn't mean to smack anything or anybody upside the head. Confront means to bring opposites face to face. So let me bring this face to face. I no longer want to see who I am in my as is self 
as a bad person, as an unworthy person, as an unqualified person, as a person that no one could imagine. I don't want to set a resolution for 2024 that says, I'm wrong, I'm bad. I got to excise this mess, this sinner stuff out of myself. No, I want to set a resolution that's accepting. I want a resolution that is loving of my as is self. And I want a resolution that invites me to become two things. May I be more accepting of my everyday as in self. May I come to love that as is self as the being that got me here today. As the 14 traits that the adult children of dysfunctional families exhibit, lost my identity, became a people pleaser and lost my identity, had a fear of authority figures, could not live my authentic self, my true life, because I needed to survive. And honey, I got that message. Did you not get that message? If I was, in my family, if I was perfect, I got everything right, I might be able to live. Because both of my sisters ahead of me set the Bruner family standard of brains. We had to have brains first. Isn't that interesting? Beauty and personality to pass, to be acceptable. And, and what was unstated was we will bring honor to our ancestors and honor to my father and mother. Now, this was crucially translated, it was crucial, and it was translated through the prism of narcissism. My father was a narcissist. His offspring existed to prove to the world how perfect he was. And I got that message when I was born and I was not perfect. Why was I not perfect? I didn't have a penis. Both of my parents were crazed when I was born. Nobody was celebrating. There was no birth announcement when I was born. I was the last child they could have, and I was not the sacred male. I was not, as that colleague I told you about, able to wake up in the morning and say, thank you, God, for making me male and white. Well, I'm going to toss cookies when I think of it. And let me continue with that history into my resolution. My resolution is to accept love, honor, and be kind and loving every day to that survivor in me that made it, made it this far. Not to hate that person, not to say, I got to get rid of those traits, not to say I'm an awful person, not to say, as 12-step groups said to me for decades, you have character defects that you got to rid yourself of. No, I'm not a defective person. I'm a human being. And what I want to do, my resolution is to embrace those characteristics, those traits that allowed me to survive. So that's resolution number one. Help me. Teach me. Empower me. And help me love those wounded parts of myself those wounded parts of myself and accept them not as sinner, not as sinful, not as flawed, not as wounded, not as humpty, dumpty, had a great fall, no, but as part of my sacred self. Let me remember those stone carvings in India where a God was a mixture of sexual and divine, where a God was a mixture of animal and human, where a God was a mixture of love and destruction. Because that's what I am. Help me accept that. And help me at the same time. And I don't want this to be an either or. Help me accept and love who I am and who I was who my survivor self had to be. Help me with that. I can't do that alone. That's why I go to meetings of trauma survivors five times a week. And if you want to hear about those, just, just contact me personally. I'll tell you, 
the international meetings I go to, the local meetings I go to, the Zoom meetings I go to, the in-person meetings I go to, where I sit with tra trauma survivors and we talk about any of life's challenges. Like, how do I learn to love? I just got it, but I know how to love. It's about uncovering it. It's not about creating it. It's about uncovering it. It's that or a resolution too, that I remember how to love. And my first resolution is just that, that I remember how to love myself. I see my, I'm not going to name them, but all the people in my life, and there are many, including myself, who are neurodiverse, whom I love. I go into this, the literary people, Wordsworth perhaps, I'm not sure, used to say, this is willing suspension of disbelief. I think it's a willing dis suspension of disbelief. I think it's a willing, choiceful susp suspension of, of perfectionism. I don't know anybody on this earth that's perfect. I mean, I, I love me some Jimmy Carter and Rosalind Carter. Those people were saints on earth. What doesn't mean they were perfect. Now, Jimmy Carter, God bless you. You're still on earth. Thank you. Guinea worm, watch out, Jimmy Carter's coming. That man eradicated with teaming up with other people. He eradicated an illness that was killing. That's sainthood. What is sainthood? It's using what we've got to give back. It's using what I've got to help other people. So that's what I'm doing with this program. I'm my jagged, even, troubled, sad, broken, loving self. So the first honest, whole resolution I have is to, whenever possible, not perfectly, but whenever I can love who I became, that survivor. Let me love that survivor. Let me not disdain that survivor. Let me let me let me not say say that what I learned to do was flawed. What I learned to do was what I had to do. It got me here today. Those are not sins. Those are not hateful things. Did I lie? Yes. Did I manipulate? Yes. Did I destroy? Yes. It's I want to forgive the child in me that pulled a wing off of the farm. I did it. I hated that. I hated myself for that. I did it. It was part of being a child in a violent home. Would I do it now? No. Would I flush a tick down the toilet? Yeah, and would it probably serve <laughs> Ticks, I do not like them. I don't want them. However, they're part of life, right? I asked a scientist for it. I mean, a man with a very scientific mind. I said, tell me, why do ticks and mosquitoes exist? And he gave me the response, uh, why do I climb the mountain? Because it's there, because they can. And that's a whole way of thinking that gets rid of the moral stuff, right? Right, wrong? So in a way, I'm moving toward that. When I say my resolution is to love accept, embrace, and honor the part of me that survived. Not to say, you poor thing, you awful thing, you defective thing, but to say, you did everything you could. And in so doing, I believe and still am by living my life, being another person on earth who's living her life. There's a friend of mine, but not so much a friend anymore, but he was for a while. He was a close friend of my husband, my husband, the man who was my husband. And he said, congratulations for no longer sleepwalking through your life. And that touched me, but in a way of superiority. It was like, okay, so everybody else is like, fooling themselves. They're, they're not up to my standard. 
the hell with this up to my standard and let me complete the second half of my resolution. The second half of my resolution is to equally discover, uncover, remove the dirt, remove the manure, remove the bindings, remove the viscera, remove the mental blindness that tells me who I am, my true self. That soulful self, I'll tell you who my true self is, it's my soul. It's my soul, that part of myself that is deep within, that's always there. Is it timeless? I hope so. Is it connected with other souls? I'd like to believe so. I don't know so, but I feel so. What am I talking about? So many experiences that feel divine. Why divine? Because there's a deeper truth in them. When I have seen beneath the self-hatred that I was raised with and seen that there's something in me that's not above anything, it's not below anything either. It's my soul that tells me when I'm choking and I can't breathe in a very frank, accepting, gender-free voice. Breathe through your nose. There's a little bit of air going in. That's all you need right now. Breathe again through your nose. Again, we have a drink your water. Help water yourself that froze as a child when you were being choked, when you were being incested orally. Help that part of myself. Let me reclaim that part of myself that doesn't judge myself as good, bad, excellent, awful. Help me reclaim that part of myself that is accepting of all people, accepting and loving. When I live that way, it's timeless. When I was in India, a man who I got to know quite well said to me, you belong here. It felt true. It felt true. And the sacred cow looked at me, stopped traffic to come across the street to push into me and let me know it needed some loving. I gave it loving. I was giving myself loving. Now I had bumps on it. I scratched its face. Cow smelled probably. I didn't smell it. I loved on it as much as I could. There was some tentativeness in it. It was a hot Hot day. And I was not, I was being myself. I was loving on the cow, not completely free to put my hand on it. Now I fear the disease or whatever. I loved on it to the extent that I could. And my second resolution for this year, my friends, as I invite you to consider your resolution, my second revolu revolution <laughs> is that too. It's a revolving. And it is a evolving spiral. It's a resolution to be more and more living soulfully. And that means living from my soul. That means every Monday when I come here, coming from my soul, I trust that soul. I used to fear that when the terrors came, when the insanity came, which I thought I was inheriting from my mother, what that meant was that my, well, partially it meant that my executive function shut down and my primitive part of my brain took over. I'm working on that. So when that part of my brain takes over and shuts me down and I can't do anything but claw my way out, the clawing my way out in that moment, if that's all I've got, that's what I've got. Let it help me. 
return to the fullness of my soulful self. My soulful self is the part of me that's the deepest part that helps me connect with your humanity and with my own. And so I marry the two resolutions as I still have that on my fingernails from Colchi, from those lovely women of Colchi. I'm working on this part. Working on this arm. Is this for a wedding? They said, No, I said, I just love the art, the living art. I love wearable art. One of them did a beautiful, oh, a typical, very deliberate design after design. And I could see her, she would take her hand like this before she would paint. She had got in touch with her rhythm. And then she painted, and I love that. The other woman was being true to herself, too. She did the same design <laughs> over and over and over, but she, and she managed to complete the task. The task was to cover my entire arm to the elbow, and she did. And some people found that the more lovely one. I like them both. And so, my friends, as I tell you what my resolution is for this year, my resolution is to accept and love and value and appreciate and be so gentle and kind to that in me that was in my past. I didn't see it as praiseworthy. I didn't see it as I thought as something I should, should be ashamed of. Not be ashamed of yourself. Well, I was. But... Yeah. When Humpty Dumpty fell, that's who he was. That's who he was. He doesn't have to be put back together again. Does he die? Yeah. Do we all die? Yeah. And my goal is to come to the end of my life, as Thoreau said, I'll put it in his words, not to discover that I have not lived, but to say, as I said, when I was 23 or 22, I want to feel at home any place on earth. Sacred. In the place where the sacred is divine and the sacred is profane and the sacred is worthy. First resolution of me accept and love. For me that I was and that I am, that I wake up with and I don't like myself. Let me accept and love on that. That's how I survived every day. If I didn't love myself, I could force myself to be better. And that was better than who I was. Second part of my resolution is not to be better. It's to be truer. Now, is that better? I'll reflect on that. You can tell me what you think. It feels different. Better feels like a moral judgment, like I'm right, I'm wrong, I'm good, I'm bad. Truer feels like to live more in alignment with life, life forces. And I know our view of life forces changed. I mean, when birth control pills became possible, the guilt and the shame for being sexual, much of that evaporated. I experienced that. Sexuality became freeing. It became closeness. It became beautiful. It became a way to say, I love you with every cell in my body, with every touch, with every look, with every caress. I love you. And it's the loving in me that can love you. So I shall continue to ask the question, is there a hierarchy between my true self and my false self? Perhaps if there is, it's this. It's my true self that knows to love all of that which I had to be to survive. Is that lesser? I'm going to say today, and I don't know if I believe it yet, but the part of me that got me here 
is not lesser. It's the truth. It's like the carvings, centuries old, even a hundred years old. The carvings that survived tsunamis, the carvings that went under the sea, under the sand, and then were freed again. It's like the carvings that I have photographs of, where the divine was the everyday, and the everyday was the divine. Help me understand this and help this resolution manifest for the well being of myself and everyone. The beginning and end. Claire Janice was my Latin teacher. Perfect because Janice was the source. The God Janice was the source of the term and month January because. Janice was two-faced, looking forward to the future and looking backward to the past. And that's a right on point, was in my resolution. I want to look at who I wake up to be, which is programmed to be. I don't like myself. Do you know what happened yesterday on my birthday? I, I, I chaired a meeting. The meeting was on choosing to be an actor, to make choices in life, rather than to be a reactor, reacting to everything I'm told about myself, rather than accepting who I am told I am, which is less than I am, rather than accepting that, to make choices, to say, this is who I am. I'm one person on earth of zillions of people that have ever been and ever will be on earth. Let me be a vehicle, a loving and loved vehicle to make a difference. Let this program make a difference. And let me remind you and me that if it, anything I said, and I, particularly in the moment when I talked about feeling like I was choking, that's been something I've lived with my whole life and feared and dreaded and would do anything to stop that remembrance of abuse. That I used to run from that. I couldn't bear it. I didn't think I could survive it because I didn't think I could survive it as a child. The only thing I knew was to dissociate and jump out of my body or to otherwise run from the moment. What I want you to know in a very pragmatic way is this. If you go online and you look up trauma warm, W-A-R-N, trauma warm lines, you will find in most states a free number you can call. And they're not all 800 numbers. So if you're in India or you are in Afghanistan or you are in Korea or you are in Tajikistan or you are in Guatemala, Canada, wherever you are, Go to that, it's an American thing right now, and I'm looking forward to hearing when other countries are doing this, or if other countries are doing it, I just don't know yet. But the warm lines are peer support groups with people who are survivors, abuse survivors, trauma survivors, who are skilled and trained, the heart fully, soul fully listen to us. When we call and say, I need. So when you look up those warm lines, you'll find a number of them are 1 800 numbers. You'll find some of them only work locally for that state. But you'll find that some of them, like New York City, Cincinnati, just keep looking, they are for everybody. Anyone can access them. And you'll find if you're dialing from overseas and you find you can't get through to a 1-800 number, maybe you can now, but look for the ones with a local area code and then dial that. Dial it from whatever country you're in. It was amazed when I was in India and I called my son and there he was when I called Ray, my ever so helpful trauma therapist. 49 years in recovery that he has? Probably. 
40 and only 36 for me soon, 35 last year. Oh, my friends, what are your resolutions if you do resolutions for the new year? Oh, my friends, how are you finding it possible to love the part of yourself that you perhaps like I was taught to hate? How can I embrace my 78-year-old self? You know, a lot of chins here, right? But I, yesterday morning, I started to say this. I finished chairing that meeting. It was a spiritual, sacred meeting. We all told the truth. I was the only female there. I listened with love. They listened with love. My soul spoke through my heart, through my articulation. Their soul spoke. I listened. I learned. I became part of a loving community that was here on earth to say, why them is enough. It's enough to give back and make a difference. And I came from that meeting and I, I went in to use the bathroom and I looked in the mirror and I saw this beautiful woman. What? Look again. Well, today, this is my, this is my anarchy. Anarchy is, I think, uh, maybe a 10th or 12th century way of the style of dress that moves. This is folk art. This is wearable art. I found this in Colchi, a department store called Pussies. I found this. It's by a brand named Biba, which is a, a loving term, a loving term, Biba. It's like, what is it in Spanish? Miha, Biba. Maybe I'll call myself one of those. As we come to this end of this program, please know when I looked at my 80, excuse me, my 77 year old face, last day to be 77 with all of the stuff, all of it, all of it. My choice to have four colors in my hair, my many chins, my jowls, my crooked nose, my eyebrows that are uneven. What the hay? What the hay? I looked in the mirror and I said, that's a beautiful woman I'm looking at. Not superior to anybody, not inferior to anybody. See the beauty. May you claim your beauty. May you touch your soul and find ways to listen to what your soul can say to you and help you learn. Time is up and I love you and I wish you a whole, complete, loving, curious, There'll be sorrowful bits, there'll be sad bits, there'll be angry bits, there will be self-hating bits, but let's take all those bits and find them as part of the whole, all worthy of love. May your 2024 be sacred and profane. May we learn together every Monday. And now, my friends, I am going to say, until next Next week, fairly well, fairly well.